Hi, I'm Arlene McIntyre, Creative Director at Ventura Design, and you're listening to Shut the Front Door, a lighthearted podcast that will bring you through the front door and into the homes of influential and interesting people. Home for me is one of the most important things in my life. My career has fortunately given me the opportunity to work closely with people and to help them create a home they will cherish forever. John McCulgan is a multi-award winning producer and director who started his career in the mid-70s at RTE, going on to become its head of entertainment. He then went on to become head of weekend entertainment on TBAM in London. John is also the director of Riverdance, Heartbeat of Home, and numerous other stage and TV productions. With his wife and business partner, Moya Doherty, together with Bill Whelan, they created Riverdance, initially as an interval act at the 1994 Eurovision contest. And then just a year later, they had produced a full two hour show, which they launched in Dublin. Riverdance went on to become the global Irish dance phenomenon that we all know, love, and are so proud of. John is also an accomplished photographer and an avid supporter of human rights and became the first ambassador for Trokera, with whom he produced the acclaimed photography exhibition and TV documentary, This is Palestine. John has four children, a daughter and three sons, including two sons with Moya. He is also grandfather to his beloved Lola. John, thank you so much for joining us today on Shut the Front Door. Arlene, thank you very much. I'm, I'm looking forward to talking to you and thank you for asking me. How are you finding the whole lockdown situation? Uh, I'm assuming that you're spending more time than ever at home at the moment. Yes, it, I, I, it's, it's kind of a, a guilty pleasure. I'm really enjoying it. And I say that in the knowledge of so many people who are having a hard time, families with small children, no garden, uh, people on the front line, people have lost their jobs. Um, you know, we're having our own difficulties. All Both of our shows are closed down. So we, we had a big six month tour, two shows out and that's all stopped obviously. But personally, I'm in a beautiful location in Holt looking out on the ocean. It's very quiet, it's very tranquil. And uh, I, that's I'm enjoying that. Very restful, I'd imagine. Yeah, I can see um, the daily light. I can see a big uh, sea link boat just going past. Uh, the sun is shining and uh, it's a lovely day here. How beautiful. And, I, you know, you're very fortunate that you can get out and go for little walks and, uh, you know, get some fresh air. Yeah, no, no, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm probably... Um, I'm not really breaking out. I'm not going into stores. I'm not, um, why does the shopping, her being younger than me, but uh, I do get out for 45 minute walk on the side of a hill where there isn't anybody, but there is fresh air and bird song and nature. So it's, it's very therapeutic. Yes. And how do you think we've been handling the lockdown in Ireland, John? In what's your opinion of everything? Uh, my relatively uneducated uh, opinion, but I do follow it all in the news and Tony Houlihan. And I think we're doing a fantastic job compared to other countries, certainly compared to the United States, uh, compared to Boris Johnson. So I have to say I'm very proud of our leaders at this time and of the health service. And I think that, you know, there there may be a post-mortem with some criticism of uh, how fast we moved on nursing homes and so on. But in the main, uh, I think we're being told the truth. Uh, in the main, we feel we uh, are in good hands. Yeah, I think we have handled it well. And um, I think we were ahead of the curve, really. And we, you know, learned from all the the tragedies that took place in Italy and Spain. So I guess they were um, countries that we could use as models on what not to do, if you like. No, no, absolutely. And I suppose uh, even though um, I'm on a certain level enjoying it, there is an underlying uh, daily stress, uh, worrying, not just worrying about yourself, but worrying about the rest of humanity and the rest of people who are so badly affected here in Ireland. Uh, and around the world, it's like a a pall hanging over um, all of us. And, uh, you know, I hope we get through it and we'll be fine. Um, well, please, God, we will. It looks like we're moving in the right direction anyway. Things seem to be uh, a little lighter on the news each day with every day that passes. So let's just hope the storm passes soon. Please, God, yeah. So I'd love to chat with you, if I may, about your first childhood memories of home, John. Can you share some of that with us? Yes, yeah, sure. I was um, I was born in Straban in County Tyrone at the end of World War II, and my father had been in the army, 
and um, we uh, moved or got a job in in ferns in a leather factory. And uh, year after year, uh, my mother had three kids. I was the eldest. So um, I was left behind in Straban with my granny. And I lived in the road called Newtown, Man Kennedy, which is a road of terraced houses that looks a bit like Coronation Street. And that was the first sort of four years of my life were spent there. And I didn't really see my mother uh, until I was about four. And I made strange with her when they when they brought me back. But I do I have fond memories and I have a photograph of me standing on the outside the terraced house pulling a little wooden horse. And uh, my granny was a rather formidable woman and uh, she read quite a bit and uh, if I was uh, messing about behind her she would comment on what I was doing and I would say how do you know what I'm doing and she said I have eyes in the back of my head so I kept looking <laughs> at the back of her head and see where these eyes were but that was the first four years and uh, I enjoyed it and uh, I had an aunt there that was very close to me uh, my my father's sister um, Auntie Bridie was there and she was very kind and very good to me and she was a sort of a surrogate mother and I had a close relationship with her for the rest of my life and I, I saw her on a regular basis and we all um, loved her. She passed away about 20 years ago but um, anyhow down to Ferns and we lived in a bungalow on a farm belonging to a wonderful family called O'Toole's so it was a, a nice bungalow three miles away from the school that I went to school. It was a lovely country school. There were uh, three teachers and uh, the, one of the teachers who taught me all of those years ago is still alive. To us, she was Miss Baker, but she became Mrs. Kinsella. And I saw her last year when I went down, she's 94 or something, in good health. She was quite a formidable strict teacher but she was a very good teacher and she was also our music teacher so we had a choir that she had put together and I sang in that choir and we went into Enniscorthy to the cathedral and we sang there and she prepared us for our confirmation and so on so it was a lovely school surrounded uh, by beautiful rolling hills and you could hear all the agricultural activity tractors and dogs barking and uh it, I really loved it, and I think it imbued in me um, living down there and all the experience of the seasons and seeing the seasons imbued in me a love of nature and the sons in the, uh, in the country, Patrick and Lewis, who unfortunately passed away, uh, were really good to me, and they took me out on the tractor and uh, they took me out at uh, night time when they were going out to look at the lambs with a tilly lamp. And those of you may know what a tilly lamp is, but it was a a lamp that you put um, kerosene and you pumped it and it gave off a very strong light. So um, season in, season out, I was involved with the farmers on in what they were doing there and my first money thinning turnips down on your knees with a hessian sack going along a drill and taking out the, the, the turnips. And then Mrs. O'Toole an extraordinary woman who would come out at lunchtime with the big hessian sack again with the bottles of tea quite often in lucasade bottles with that stippled neck and the tea would be have the sugar and the milk and everything mixed in and then big doorstops of sandwiches so you'd sit in the sunshine i always thought it was sunny and with the other working man and you'd have your lunch in the hedge in the field and i loved my teacher in school a man called mr lynch and he was um, in charge of the Amateur Dramatic Society in Enniscorthy. He was also an amateur magician and historian. So he, I was really fortunate to have him as a teacher. So he made history so interesting and he made us read plays and read Shakespeare. And then he would do some magic tricks. So that was, he was fantastic. It was a mixed school. And uh, the girl who brought me to school, a girl called Josephine O'Toole, she was about five or six years older than me, but she took me to school when I was four or four and a half. And uh, she was a, a great friend. She was also very interested in theatre. And when she went to secondary school, she was one of the uh, leaders in the in the in Tullow, 
in the musical society in, in the school. So uh, the first show I ever saw live on stage was HMS Pinafore. And she was in that, and I was riveted and fascinated by that. So it, it probably was one of the first things that sparked my love of uh, of theatre and live performance. Yes, that was my next question, actually. When did your passion for TV and stage begin? Well, I think it might have been, it certainly that contributed to it, the, the shows that I saw her performing in, in Tullow National School. And there were, my memory of it, it was to quite a high musical standard. And then there was uh, traveling players in Ireland at the time called the fit-ups. And there were uh, a bunch of actors and musicians who toured parish halls in Ireland. And there was a little tin hall in Tom Brack. Tom Brack was uh, two pubs, uh, a petrol station and a very small grocery station and a, a hall. And in that hall, there, was a, there were pl- different groups of players, but I do remember uh, Paddy Dooley players. And uh, one of the Paddy Dooley players uh, was a woman called Annie Dalton, and she ended up in the Reardons. She was Minnie in the Reardons uh, years years later. But they were actors, and that was how they made a living at the time. They they went out and they put the, the set and the lighting, whatever it was, in the back of a van or two vans, and they went uh, stayed in guest houses, and they went up out around the country putting up posters and putting on plays and... Uh, Variety. I remember the name of one of the plays was His Mother's Rosary. The other one was Kevin Barry, and they tended to be melodramatic. And at that age, the melodrama I enjoyed enormously. And I think it was a combination of that. And then I loved movies. I didn't get to see that many, but sometimes my father would take me uh, on the bicycle into the cinema in Ferns. And um, seeing, I remember seeing movies in there. And Riverdance was such an incredible production um, and no doubt a dream project for you, John. Can you share a little more with me on how that all began? My real preparation for that was then eventually um, started work in Dublin as a telegram boy. And uh, I I worked in factories and pubs and in... uh, Saxons and O'Connell Street, Bests and O'Connell Street, but eventually through a circuitous route, I ended up in RTE as a vision mixer when I was 17. And that was like amazing just to 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 get in there. And I just loved it. And RTE was my university. I was a vision mixer. I was a cameraman for four years. I was a floor manager. Then I was a producer director. And then I was head of entertainment. So all of those years in RTE working on a huge range of uh, variety program, documentaries, drama. And I ate it up because, uh, as I said, this was my education and going into work with people who were fantastic, mature to me. They were old people, but there were people who knew about theatre, knew about television. So um, I learned a lot, and that's where I learned uh, the, the stagecraft and the television craft, I think. And that led you to the, your, well, what I'd imagine was a dream project for you, which was Riverdance. Can you it share was. a little well, bit more with me on that? To be, it, was, it, started with, uh, it started with my, my wife, I think. She had come to see a show that I had done in the National Concert Hall. It was called Mayo 5000, and there were a lot of uh, artists on there. But there were two artists. Uh, one was Michael Flatley and the other was Gene Butler, who were performing separately. And they were American and they were charismatic. And I had cast them because they were American and because they were charismatic. And we, I remember Moy and I talking about it afterwards, saying we must do something with them because they're quite special uh, on the history or the evolution of Irish dance. And uh, Fade to Black and Fade Up, about two months later, she was offered to produce the Eurovision Song Contest. And uh, she decided that she would uh, get together with Flatley and Butler and do the version that everybody now knows that began the the river dance that she put that together and the choreographer was Mavis Ascot and Michael Flatley and um so that was the seven minutes as the one of the one of the rather over the top headlines had seven minutes to change the world but it uh, I was Moy was backstage calling up the different countries from around the world uh, as they came in for voting and uh, I was sitting out with the audience and when Riverdance finished there was about two seconds of absolute silence 
and then everybody as one jumped to their feet in a, in a tremendous roar of appreciation and applause. And I'd never seen that before. And the audience weren't sure what they were going to get as the end of a act, but that was the first time that Riverdance appeared in public. And it was a phenomenal impact in the theatre that night in the point and on television as it was seen all around Europe. So that was the first river dance, which was an instant. And we decided on that night, myself and Moya Darty and Bill Whelan, who was commissioned to uh, compose the music, we decided to turn it into a full scale theatrical show, which we did. And that went on exactly one year later uh, in the same venue. I will never forget watching that that um, show live uh, from my television that evening. And literally, it was just so powerful. I think everyone's hearts were banging in their chests when they were watching that. It was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. People still say to this day, I remember where it's one of those. I remember where I was when I saw that. And around uh, anecdotal tales around the country in Ireland and pubs where people would normally talk. But when it came on, suddenly a silence descended on the pub and people were fixated and fascinated by what they were seeing and people in the pubs and in locations jumped to their feet and applauded around the country so it did mm. it had such it had such an impact and it was down to it hadn't been done that way before which was Moya's concept it was down to Michael Flatley, Gene Butler, um, Bill Whelan with the great score and the, the stars aligned and uh, it just changed Irish dance forever. That's for sure. The stars aligned. I love that. And what inspires you, John? Um, I, I, I never consciously think about it very much, but when I'm asked, I suppose I love how fortunate I am to be in a business where um, every morning I get up, I look forward to going to work. I look forward to creating something or directing something that will make people excited or happy and um, to to be able to work with talented people, to be able to work with musicians and uh, dancers and to feed off these young people who are now so, they're athletes, they're so smart, they're so intelligent, they're so fit, they're fantastic to work with. So it's a bit like uh, Dracula. I, I feed off these young people and they keep me young. Yes, I can't imagine. And then, of course, Riverdance brought you to many different countries. I believe you traveled quite a lot, including China. I did. Well, in the very beginning, the show, um, when we opened in the point, we brought a number of promoters from uh, the United States and Germany and the UK, and all of them instantly saw the potential and fell in love with it. So almost immediately, we were in Hammersmith, a 6,000-seater theater in London, and, and that was huge and after that we went to Radio City Music Hall and we sold it out for three weeks which had never been done before by a single show because again it's a 6,000 um, seater theatre so we were on a roll and every promoter in, in every country in the world wanted Riverdance so we made the decision to put up a second company and the demand was so great that we put up a third company so there were three river dances touring the world and uh, there was a demand for a fourth company but i said i can't do it the the talent pool uh, you know we spread ourselves too thin and just in terms of quality control and making sure that it was the best it could be we had three productions running for about five years then we had two then we had one then we had two again and this year with the COVID, uh, we were we had started our two shows. One had started in in the back in the board gosh where it all began, the twenty fifth anniversary, and that was touring in the United Kingdom, and I was in New York with the Radio City once again with uh, ten shows sold out. We got to do three shows, and everything shut down all of Broadway, all of America, all of the UK. So our two companies. Uh, with a heavy heart, we're sent home. And uh, we are now working on when we can get out those tours again. It's obviously, it's out of our hands to some degree, but at the moment we are penciled uh, to start a um, United States tour in December of this year. And then the UK tour to start in August of um, next year. And we have another show that uh, to go to China 
in October of this year, and I hope that will come to pass, but we won't know for a while yet. And how do you find the different audiences with the different um, in, in like uh, nationalities? Uh, what's it yes, like performing? Yes, we, we did. We thought. Produ- uh, what's I mean, it like having a production in China? China is is we are the one, I suppose, company in China that can tour. We we tour fifteen cities in China, and China don't automatically welcome Western shows and Broadway shows. Or even the the wickeds and the big shows don't go down that well there, except for. Uh, Shanghai and Beijing. So we have been touring um, China every year for about 15 years. So we're really, really well known. And we've appeared on the Chinese New Year's Eve show, which is the biggest thing you can get on. That is an audience of 500 million. So that's kind of kicked us off down there. And um, we're booking another tour down there, as I say, starting this uh, um, October. What are the American audiences like in comparison to the Chinese? Oh, the Americans are, are possibly the the best. Um, what what surprised me? America is very warm and and very friendly, and and they love applauding and they love standing up and they love cheering. So they come to the theater or they come to our show uh, predetermined to enjoy themselves. So they're in the main. They're they know they're going to have a good time. They have a sense of what the show is. They've seen it on uh, television, and uh, so they they give a sense of that. And as we've toured, we've done about 15 tours of America, and an awful lot of people come back for the second, third, fourth time. So, um, you know, we, we get a lot of return business in the United States. The second market that loves us is Germany. We, we've done about 12 tours in Germany. We've been in Japan, New Zealand, Australia, Mexico, uh, South Africa, and so we we've been almost everywhere into every every country in Europe. But we had uh, the first time we went to Japan. There's a big number in the opening of the show, which has a big, and we call it a button, a big stop. The dancer puts his hands in the air, and there's a big ta-da. It normally gets thunderous applause, and in Japan there was silence. So oh, wow. we thought they hated. But it's just a different way of responding. By the end, they were on their feet and throwing roses. And so so that was the same at the beginning in China. They weren't quite sure how to react. And now they, they, they're they getting more sophisticated. Yeah. We went to China the first time. There were all these bicycles on the streets, thousands and thousands of bicycles. And uh, the, the Chinese hat and Mao Zedong kind of drab suits. And now uh, there are... Mercedes and high-end cars and there's just traffic jams everywhere. The whole of Beijing is a constant traffic jam and Shanghai. And uh, there is so much disposable income now in China that they have all these high-end malls with the Pradas and the Gucci's and all the high-end brand stuff. So um, the Chinese mm-hmm. love spending on high-end brands. And you'll notice now, in, or I'll notice in Dublin, if you go into Brown Thomas, they have hired quite a few Chinese shop assistants, because the Chinese, when they travel, like to go high end and buy the original article. Yeah, and traveling is such an exciting part of 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 everything that you, you yourself and Moya do. But do you like coming home at the end of it all? Do you enjoy oh, yes. coming back to Ireland? Yes, yes, I do. I, I always love traveling, and I love getting on an airplane. And there's still, I still have that sort of childish sense of excitement as the airplane takes off and you have a six hour and eight hour or sometimes a 12 hour journey and you're in that cocoon and I love that that excitement and I still do and I don't travel as much as I did when the three shows were on the road I was kind of uh, I was traveling constantly which was you know 25 26 27 years ago which is fine i don't want to do that i don't need to do it anymore i have a great guy called Boric moyles mm-hmm. who is a mini me and he makes sure that everything is is mm-hmm. running absolutely smoothly and absolutely precisely he's a great guy and he was a lead dancer in the show for 18 years and uh, as mm-hmm. was his wife so but Boric is great so the the and each company now has as a separate management so they go on the road with a production with an accountant with a manager with a physiotherapist with the masseuse and so on so they're self-contained little traveling businesses so how do you find the balance when you come home what things do you like to do when you come home from or or, or even in the past when you traveled quite a bit what did you like to do when you when you first come home would you like, I like cooking to, or i like to get out 
in the Irish fresh air and walk and lucky to mm. live in Holt and I lived out in Meath before that but I like to, to walk and I like not to go into the office for at least two or three days and uh, and then I like going out to dinner with my wife and I like going to the theatre and I go into movies and then normally there's time to go back in and start working on the next tour and uh, so there are other shows I have a show called Heartbeat of Home which toured America and the UK um, last year and a couple of years ago and was a great success. So we're hoping to get that show out on on tour um, next year, towards the end of next year. And I bet you have loads of amazing memorabilia in your home from your travels, do you? Not, not, I'm, not, I'm not a great collector. I just see I'm in my little office here and I see thousands of uh river dance lanyards from, from different countries hanging on the back of my door here. Uh, I have some programs from different cities and in different iterations of the show. No, I, I don't really have a lot of, of memorabilia, but we are, at the moment we have uh, somebody who is archiving everything because they, we have an incredible amount of uh, archive material in terms of photographs and videos. We, we've probably done four documentaries. The very first one was River Dance the Show, and I directed that uh, in the for television, I directed it in the in the point, and then we had uh, River Dance in Radio City Music Hall. We had River Dance in Geneva, and we had River Dance in Beijing. So they're still all around. Then we did a documentary called The First Ten Years, and Gabriel Byrne presented that, and uh, we did another documentary River Dance in China. So we we've an awful lot of material. And um, that's all been archived and logged so that, uh, you know, we can put it together. We have a documentary that we did with the BBC, uh, which is going out next Tuesday. We have a new dancer called uh, Amy May from uh, from County Tyrone, and I'm from Tyrone. So she came through the summer school, and she's a big head of red hair. She looks a bit like Jean Butler. So uh, she became a lead. And this is the story of choosing her to be the lead in the three arena. And it's behind the scenes, the journey to her uh, living her dream. It's called Living the Riverdance Dream. And that's going out next week. And there were another number of other documentaries. So we have a huge amount of uh, archival material. And tell me, John, how do you unwind in the evenings? I'm very fond of uh, Irish whiskey and I'm very fond of red wine. And my wife's a great cook, so we would uh, have a nice dinner and drink some wine and then might look at something on Netflix. Or So that would be a lot of the evenings, and then I like to read a lot. So that's how you both relax. Yeah, we sort of turn off the television and sit and talk and uh, about the day or about whatever's going on, and then we choose something to watch, and whether it's Curb Your Enthusiasm or... Shit's Creek or what else we were watching? We were watching Money Heist, we were watching uh, Unorthodox. So there's, there's some great, great programs on, on Netflix. Yeah, Unorthodox is very good. I just finished that actually the other night. It was very clever. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very clever, based on a true story and uh, based on a book by the woman who went through that experience. And how does social media fit into your life? Um social media i don't handle it directly myself i mean i do i am uh facebook i I follow what our guys are doing on facebook or occasionally post facebook and instagram but only but we have people who are in the office who are that's their job is posting on social media and communicating that way Uh, at the moment we're doing. We're just doing a series of recordings of all our, not all our dancers, but a lot of them who are on lockdown. So each of them are sending us a video of themselves dancing in their own style, in their own home, or outside their own home, or in their own country. So the videos are coming in from uh, Australia, America, Russian, Russia, England, and around Ireland. And we're going to put all those together and put them up on the website next week. Wow, I'll have to watch for that. I'll keep an eye out for that. That sounds really good. Yeah. Can you share a little bit with me about your humanitarian work? 
Yeah, I, 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 I uh, my, my, my brother Jerry that I, I worked with, he had uh, made a couple of documentaries for Troper over the years, and uh, I did a photographic exhibition. I take photographs as well, and I did one for the lifeboat here in Hoth, and I did a series called uh, Hoth Horizons. The horizon was at the same level in every picture, and it was it was sunrises and sunsets around. Uh, around Holt and uh, had a, had them printed up to a large size and raised about 40000 for the lifeboat. And from that, Jared said to me, would you do something for Trokra? So we met and worked and met Trokra and they were very keen. So, and I was very keen to support them. They're a wonderful organization. And uh, so my, my first job or my first uh, expedition with them was to Palestine, Israel. And, um, I presented the documentary. It was called This is Palestine. And I, just, I think it's still on the uh, Troker website and it's still on YouTube. But there was a huge, it's been viewed three quarters of a million times. And uh, it's gone out on TG Cahar three times, I think. So that was that. And then I went to Guatemala and Haiti. And I was planning this year to go to Malawi. And uh, that obviously is st- stood down. But I really like the troper of people there in 20 locations around the world they do incredible work they're well organized uh, they're very passionate about what they do so i published a book them called we're under the same moon which was a series of photographs that i'd taken in uh, palestine and israel and uh, i had a photographic exhibition which toured ireland and is um, going back to belfast i think later this year so, but that was, for me was doing something that I really love to do, and I, I got more from it than, than, than they got. So, um, and I helped them raise money. I written letters to a whole lot of people, traveled with them to New York earlier this year, and got a whole lot of the great of the good in a room, and got commitments from people in business to commit to a certain amount a year, because it's really hard for charities and Troker included in that fundraise at the moment there's nobody you know it's hard to raise any money john would you describe yourself as a spiritual person a spiritual i suppose i i uh am i yes i i I don't know whether i believe in god or not and um i still like uh, brendan bean used to say i'll probably be a deathbed catholic and return just in case to ensure (laughs) take (laughs) some insurance (laughs) Uh, but I, I, I'm nearly sure there isn't an afterlife. And, uh, but again, I said, I'll leave 5% of it for insurance purposes there. Uh, I believe in, uh, humanity and kindness. And I think that you cannot walk through your life, uh, uh, looking straight ahead that you have to see the community around you. And if you can contribute and if you can help your brother or sister on the way, I think you have to do that. And, uh, I try to do that. I work with another charity called CASA that works with people with uh, physical and intellectual disability. And I've been working with, with them on and off for about 10 years. I went to Lourdes with them uh, um, about five years ago. So it's just on the basis, uh, if you can, and if you're fortunate enough to be able to support or help other people, I think you have to do something. Yes, totally. Definitely, especially now. I think more than ever, everyone just needs to come together now. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. But it's also, it's. I mean, it, 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 it's not saintly. It's uplifting. I think you. It's really for sure. good for anybody to do something. There's a good feeling, and people appreciate it, and you feel good in yourself that you're hopefully making a difference and making an effort. Yeah, definitely. And what one piece in your home have you collected on your travels that would have you know a lot of sentimental value and there's almost almost nothing that i collected on my travels really we do have a a, a nice art collection we have mm-hmm. fantastic paintings and um, we uh, our, moya is really the the interior person in terms of decor and furniture she sort of drives all that and she has great taste and uh she does that i don't tend not to bring stuff back from travels uh, I, i've only just thought about it now i just don't do it and uh you know i would bring presents and stuff home but uh no there, there is no 
item sitting in the house that came from from travels. Uh, we have sculptors in the garden. Um, I commissioned James Hanley to do a portrait of my mother and a portrait of my father, which were fantastic, and they're both passed, but the wow. portraits were fantastic, and I got copies for all my mm-hmm. siblings. I have six sisters and two brothers. And I know you're a very big family man, John. So what's Christmas like for you and how do you spend Christmas? Christmas is great. Um, we really enjoy it, it particularly when, they, when, when the kids were smaller. But Moya is a great hostess and we had a wonderful housekeeper called Nuno Shea. So in Danes Hollow, uh, the house that we were in, we would have 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 people around at Christmas for a, for a Christmas party. And we really enjoyed decorating the house and lights everywhere and uh, pea lights and Christmas trees and Christmas music uh, on the uh, on the sound systems. And the kids, even once December started, they would say, put on the Christmas music, Dad. So they became <laughs> the Christmas Christmas guys as well. In the last few years, when Moya wasn't well, we, had, uh, we, we went into um, the Westbury, a couple of nights and had uh, our immediate family and, and my daughter Lucy and her husband Michael and uh, my granddaughter Lola that I am madly in, in love with and that's one of the downsides of the lockdown. I'm missing seeing her and hugging her and Lucy my daughter told me last week that uh, Lola was holding something close to her chest and uh, Lucy said what's that and then Lola burst into tears and it was a picture of herself and myself and she said i want to see papa and lola said we'll mm. we'll facetime him and lola, and lola said um no i don't want to facetime him i want to see him for real so that's hard for kids who you know who and it's not just me but all the, all the grandparents who can't hug their grandchildren at this time is hard mm. it is it's really really hard i've heard similar stories you know and it's it's just it's difficult hopefully this won't continue you know for much longer Um, i wonder what the new normal will hold for us all will we be allowed to give each other big hugs again what do you think i think so i think the whole country will go mad there'll be street parties and people will hug each other to death (laughs) permission i'd say the country will go mad and already there are people trying to sneak out and escape out but most people are being very responsible and most people are taken the advice which is which is the right thing to do that's true that's true and who have been your icons in life um icons in life i suppose there's different ones i suppose as a child i was you know i was as a young man elvis presley was my my big music uh, icon and then i loved actors from Laurence Olivier to Richard Harris to Richard Burton to Vivian Lee, Clark Gable. I love the movies. I love theatre. I thought I was going to be an actor. I did some acting when I was in my teens and uh, that was what I thought I wanted to do. I still think I might give it a try. It's not too late yet. I can play old men. <laughs> it's never too late. Never too late. And uh the other thing that I'm planning to do at the moment, um, which I'm just, it, you'll be the first to hear, I'm planning to do a series of podcasts myself called My Tunes, which Fantastic. we did to, to our radio type podcast with Senior Times, that magazine, uh, based on a very eclectic uh, range of music, which are My Tunes, starting from the 50s right up to today, from classical to rock to pop to uh, opera and comedy so i'm going to start doing that from my home in uh, in uh, as soon as this lockdown thing finishes that sounds exciting yeah. and what advice would you give to your younger self john uh what advice I'd, yeah i i always went for it and i was always uh, optimistic uh i always had a very high opinion of myself in so much as that i thought i could achieve anything if I really went for it. And in the main, that turned out to be the case. So, um, yeah, I, I, I do it all over again. I mean, I made mistakes, of course, and there were things I did, and we had shows that uh, were fantastic and didn't work and lost money. So, you know, it's, it's not all 
it's not all positive. There were things where we had a show called The Pirate Queen, which was a fantastic show written by Alain Bobil and Claude Michel Schoenberg. And we opened in Chicago and then went to New York. And uh, it had been going really well. And it was a big costume drama, very expensive show based on Grace O'Malley uh, and Queen Elizabeth I. But the New York Times, Ben Brantley, gave it a very negative review and that kind of killed it. So we closed after about three months, which was like, you know, losing your child that you've been pregnant with for five years. But that's part of the business as well. That's, there's the up and the down. And uh, it's always a risk. You never know in this business when you put up a show and, and you give it all your heart and soul and you get as many talented people as you can around you and who are as passionate and committed as you are. But that in itself doesn't uh, guarantee success. And you look at Andrew Lloyd Webber, who has had huge successes with Phantom and, and other shows, but he had about six shows in a row that just didn't work. And uh, so yeah. that's the business. So what, in your opinion, are the key ingredients to to success, especially in this business? What do you feel are those very important um tools that you need to know and understand in order to make a real go at at show business well, and, my, and, and yeah, huge massive productions to try to understand the audience uh, to not patronize the audience to understand the audience to understand what in your view excites them and gives them pleasure and then to do it to the absolute best of your ability and never to settle for anything less and then to try to put together the best people the most creative people the most passionate people and when you all come together and you all believe in the same project, uh, there's an enormous buzz from that. And uh, that's what you have to do. And it wouldn't be exclusive to me, but most people who put on shows give it all, give it their heart and soul and put everything into it. And sometimes it works. And more often than not, it doesn't work because there's so many shows on Broadway. There's so many shows that go on with good people with big names that fail uh, because they didn't, for whatever reason, connect with the audience. Yeah, I remember you saying that to me once before, that understanding your, your audience is really key. It's absolutely key. I try to, when I'm putting a show up and when I'm rehearsing and when I'm in the theatre, I, I, I sit in the theatre as an audience member and I try to understand um, emotionally and visually what the audience might experience. And I try and tailor the work to impact the audience as best I can and uh, to get them to respond, to construct a show in a certain way. Uh, and that's years and years and years of experience where you can make drive people to their feet by how exciting the finale is and how exciting the end of part one is and so on. So some of it comes with... Uh, a lot of, you know, 30 years experience, um, but 40 years experience, actually. So you bring all your experience and all your love of the theatre and your love of the audience and the craft that you understand and love, and you bring that to bear in the project, and then you just do the very best you can. That's right. I remember reading something that John F. Kennedy said about the holding of the candle, you know, is often the most exciting part of any project. You know, it's... It's that whole creative process, everything in between, you know? Yeah, yeah, it is. And I'm lucky to be, and I'm working poor, and we talk about it, uh, lucky to be in the business. And he says it's not like work at all. You, you know, you look forward to going into work every day and how lucky are we to be in a business where we travel and have this show that we all love and have work with dancers and singers and musicians that we love. And what a great business. What a great business and what do you think is the first thing you're going to do when the pandemic is finally over uh i'm probably going to go down to king citric in hoth with my wife and have a lovely soul on the bone with some nice um red wines my one of my favorite fish restaurants and then i'm going to hug my granddaughter and hug my family and my brothers and sisters and my sons mark and danny and my daughter Lucy, my other son, Justin, is in California uh, near Newport Beach. But I'm looking forward to seeing them and kissing them and hugging them and touching them. So that would be 
a great excitement and it's something to really look forward to. Now I'm going to ask you a few quick fire questions, John, okay. which are just a, a sure. little bit of it's a separate segment to sure. it all. So are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. Sweet or savory? Savory. Red or white wine? Red. Bath or shower? Mm, shower. Stage or screen? Um, I, I, I stage for my work is screen for my, I love movies. And uh, so, but I suppose stage. City or the country? Uh, I love the country, but I live in the city. Cooking in or eating out? I think you have to do both to enjoy them. My wife's a great cook, so we cook in quite a bit, and then we enjoy going to really nice restaurants for dinner, so it's a mix. Vacations or staycations? Uh, Again, it would have to be both. I wouldn't say one or the other. Uh, I think probably after this we won't travel for a while, but I'm looking forward to... Uh, we had planned a trip up along the Wild Atlantic Way going, uh, and staying in, in B&Bs. Uh, we were really looking forward and taking our bicycles. So at my age, uh, I have now a fabulous electric bike, which means that it's not quite as punishing when you're traveling the country roads and going up the hills. So I love my electric bike. Broadway or the West End? Um, they are two sides of the same pain, but the, the West End is is... Easier to work. Broadway is very tough, very hard, very unionized, um, and uh, very expensive. So, you know, you could um, you know, lose between three and ten million there very quickly. And my final question: Donald Trump or Boris Johnson? Uh, Barack Obama. <laughs> You have such a lovely, soothing voice, John, and you're a wonderful storyteller. And thank you so much for chatting with me today. Oh, thank you, Arlene. I hope it uh, it lift, lived up to your expectations in any event. And thank you for talking. <laughs> it did. Thank you, and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.